Okay, so it's time to start. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Alexandra Kutiralova from MIT. And uh, she will speak about Harris Chandra bimodules of complex in complex rack. So please go ahead. Sasha. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, I uh, just before I start, I just wanted to say that uh, last uh, 10 or so days uh, were quite devastating to me and um, all my thoughts and uh, my heart right now are with uh, Ukrainian people and I I, um so 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 doing it all so, so i i don't use social media that much and uh, so talks uh, probably is the only way for me to speak publicly and when i speak publicly i just cannot be silent about this and just wanted to say that i is that yeah so this, this war has war has to be stopped it's uh, awful and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah i guess that's what I wanted to say. And uh, so about the talk now. So uh, it's called Harris Chandra by modules in complex rank. And um, when I say that something is in complex rank, I will always mean that I consider it in the context of the Delin tensor categories. So let me um, start by giving a quick overview uh, of the structures doc. So I'll uh, cover some results from two of my reference you can find them on archive and they concern Harshandra by modules in, in complex rank and uh, so I'll start with giving an overview of the Delin categories I'll uh, give all the definitions and we'll talk about some properties of these categories and uh, then I'll uh, introduce the so-called ultra product construction and it will be an important tool for us to work with these categories uh, and in the second half, uh, we'll discuss Harris Chandra by modules. And I'll uh, give the, well, I'll state all the definitions, uh, both for the classical Harris Chandra by modules and for the complex rank uh, analogs of them. And I'll give uh, some classification of uh, central character, both in the classical case and in the case of uh, complex rank in, in the dealing categories. And lastly, last thing I want to talk about is uh, the so-called Harris Chandra by modules of finite k type. So, yeah, so that's the plan. And uh, okay, so we'll start with uh, doing categories. So the categories rep GL team are intuitively speaking interpolations of uh, the categories of representations of group GLM to complex values of the parameter n. And now more rigorously, we define them as following. So we take the Karubi envelope of the symmetric rigid monoidal category that is generated by a single object V that has dimension T. And uh, we require that uh, endomorphisms of the case tensor power of V are given precisely by the group algebra of the symmetric group SK. And SK acts here by permuting the tensor factors. And we also require that there are no homes between the case tensor power of E and the L tensor power of E unless uh, K and L are equal. And let me break down this definition a little bit. So when I say that we take the Karubi envelope, I mean that we formally adjoin images of all idempotent and uh, finite direct sums. So, uh, when I say that uh, V has dimension T, I mean this in the categorical sense. So uh, we can compose uh, co-evaluation and evaluation when we need to flip uh, to tensor factors on the way. Uh, so then it will be a map from the unit object to itself. And uh, it will be some multiplication by some complex number. And we say that this complex number is our complex parameter T. And uh, now, uh, so we take this category that is uh, monoidal generated by some single object V. Therefore, every indecomposable object will be direct summoned in the objects which I denote RS. 
And this is just the tensor product of R copies of V and S copies of V dual. Okay, uh, so I will uh, only give all the definitions and the constructions uh, for the type A case that is in the category step GLT. Uh, however, there are also categories rep OT and rep SP to T that uh, interpolate the categories of representations for other classical groups. And, uh, and uh, all the definitions and results can be generalized to these categories, except for maybe only the last, last part of the talk when I talk about the categorical actions. Uh, I mean, it probably can also be generalized in some sense, but I just didn't do this. And uh, yeah, so, so we generalize this jointly with uh, Serena. Um, okay, and um, so now we want to understand more about the categories. Now if you look uh, at the home space between two uh, generating objects, Rs and R prime S prime, uh, using duality, we see that it's the same as uh, homes from the R plus S prime uh, tensor power of E and R prime plus S uh, tensor power of E. And uh, we require that this is zero unless the two sums are equal. But uh, it will be it would be nice also to understand this. So this is just the isomorphism of two vector spaces, and we would like to understand the algebra structure of endomorphisms as well. And uh, well, it turns out that uh, so endomorphisms of this object are S uh, is the so-called walled Brouwer algebra uh, denoted by BRST. And this algebra has a nice diagrammatic description, so you can construct the basis for this algebra using some diagrams and then compose these diagrams, and it's uh, it's rather nice, but uh, I, I'm not sure if I'll have time to give the full definition for this, but uh, we can study this algebra. And uh, one uh, easy a thing we, we can note about this uh, algebra is that uh, there is a, an injection from the group algebra of the product of two symmetric groups uh, into BRST. And this is due to the fact that, uh, well, the first symmetric group acts by permuting the uh, R copies of V. So, so RS is just the, the tensor product of R copies of V and S copies of V dual. So the first symmetric group permutes R copies of V and the second symmetric group permutes uh, S copies of V dual. So we have this embedding um, of algebras. And it turns out that there is also a splitting map uh, pi from BRST to this uh, group algebra. And uh, roughly spe speaking, uh, so we need to generate an ideal by the maps from RS to RS that involve not only permutations, but also taking the evaluation and co-evaluation. So we can uh, compose, like we can uh, take one copy of E and one copy of E dual, take evaluation and then compose it with co-evaluation. It is a valid map from RS to itself. And uh, if we now generate an ideal by all the such maps, then uh, the quotient by this ideal will give us a splitting. And uh, so, so if we now want to classify decomposable objects in uh, RepGLT, we need to classify primitive idempotence in BRST. So this was done by Kant and Wilson, and the result is the following. So recall that uh, primitive idempotence in the group algebra of uh, symmetric group SK are classified by partitions of K. So if nu is a partition of K, I denote by Z nu the corresponding primitive idempotent. Now, uh, if you have a bipartition, that is just a pair, a pair of partitions, lambda and mu, such that lambda is a partition of R and mu is a partition of S, then there exists a unique primitive idempotent, uh, E lambda mu in BRS team. And it is defined by the property that pi of E lambda mu is uh, the tensor product of Z lambda with Z mu. And uh, 
note that uh, since we have also an embedding of the group algebra of uh, the product of symmetric groups into our BRST, then uh, the lambda turns the z mu is actually a valid element in BRST. And it will be idempotent, but it will no longer be a primitive idempotent. So E lambda mu will be its uh, unique uh, primitive summand that is mapped to something non-zero via map pi. And uh, this is the full classification of primitive idempotents of, uh, inside BRST. And as a corollary of this, we get that uh, indecomposable objects of REP GLT are labeled by, by partitions, lambda mu, and uh, well, I denote by V lambda mu the corresponding indecomposable object. And uh, uh, clearly, if lambda is a partition of R and mu is a partition of S, then uh, V lambda mu will be a direct summon inside uh, this um, generating object RS. And uh, moreover, uh, having this description, we can also uh, say that uh, V lambda mu is actually summoned inside the uh, sure functor S lambda applied to V, then the sure functor S mu applied to V dual. Okay, so that's our decomposable objects. Now, um, the link categories they enjoy a nice universal property. So uh, let D be any symmetric tender category. Then uh, the set of uh, isomorphism classes of uh, symmetric tender functors from rep GLT to D is uh, in bijection with a set of objects of D of dimension T. And uh, we just send the functor f to its image on the, the uh, generating object v. And as a corollary of this, we get that uh, when uh, t is a positive integer, uh, then uh, we get a symmetric tensor functor f from rep GLT to the category of complex uh, representations uh, of with the group GLM that sends our generating object v to vn. Uh, the tautological and dimensional representation of GLN. And, uh, well, I mean, it is a natural question to ask, so how do these categories compare to each other when uh, T is a positive integer? And uh, so yeah, we, we have this uh, symmetric tensor functor, but what is it? Is it an equivalence or no? And, uh, well, the easy, Thing we, we can see uh, right away is that it's not uh, faithful. So uh, recall that we had this condition that uh, endomorphisms of the k tensor power of V were precisely the group algebra of SK. Now, uh, if we plug in an n dimensional vector space into this equation and we say that k is a is greater than n, then uh, well, the skew symmetrizer here will act by zero on the dimensional vector space. So it's clearly not faithful, but it turns out that it's uh, essentially subjective and uh, full. Okay, so let's now uh, describe where it sends our decomposable objects. So we have a bipartition lambda and mu. And the length of uh, lambda is L, length of mu is M, and we require that N is greater or equal than uh, L plus M. Then we can define uh, the following weight. Uh, so as you noted, lambda mu N. And we first we put the parts of the partition lambda in the decreasing order. Then uh, there is a bunch of zeros. And then, uh, well, we put the minus the parts of uh, mu in the increasing order. And uh, it's easy to see that what we get, uh, so, so and the length of this uh, vector is n. And uh, what we get is a, a integer dominant weight of GLM. And uh, so if uh, t is equal to n and n is greater or equal than L plus m, then our functor f sends uh, V lambda mu to the uh, simple highest weight representation uh, of GLN with the highest weight lambda mu n. And when T, well, 
when uh, n is less than l plus m, then uh, this f sends the corresponding uh, indecomposable object to zero. Um, okay, and uh, so the last uh, thing I want to say about the dealing categories in general is that uh, so it turns out that, uh, so, so a priori, our categories were constructed as a B envelope of something additive. So they are, the well, the best thing we can hope for is that they are Caribbean. Uh, however, when T is not an integer, uh, they turned out to be actually abelian and semi-simple. So, and so it works if and only if T is not an integer, so when T, is an integer, they are not that nice. They are not a billion. Okay, uh, questions about the uh, categories in general? I, I have a question. So in, in the case when it's not a billion, does it have any structure like uh, exact or anything um, like this? Uh, so what do you mean? So, 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 which, so, so it's going to be a, a Caribbean uh, tensor categories. Ah, okay, so there's the kind of trivial exact structure, right? But is there some other interesting exact structure there? I, I think I, I, I don't really know what it means. Ah, okay, so Sorry. I mean, uh, abelian means you have a short exact sequence, each oh, one yeah. has some kernel, co-kernel. So, you know, exact just means that maybe you don't have this, but you have some class of exact sequences. And you can define some X group, you can do some homological algebra still. I um, see, I see. Um, it's just a guess, I mean, or if there is some, to get some feeling, I, I'm not so familiar with this kind. I, okay. Um, I, I'm, I, uh, well, I, actually, I, I don't really know the, but uh, so. Yeah, but okay, I mean, it's anyway, it's semi simple in this case. So probably yeah, so, uh, the so, trivial exact, the split extract structure is the only reasonable one, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but, but splits ones are included. Yes, by construction. Yeah. Instruction, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, otherwise, yeah, I don't really know. So, no, I just wanted to get the feeling for the, yeah. the f failure of being a billion somehow. What is that? I see, I see. Okay. Uh, but, um, That's yeah, okay. no, no. Uh, um, okay. So, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So this statement about uh, rep GLT uh, interpolars rep GL and C, does it require sure well duality between GL and C and symmetry group? In like, I mean, this happened for rep ST that. Uh, uh, sorry, 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 can you? So, so this statement about that rep, the Dillian category rep GLT interpolates rep GL and C. Yeah. Do we? need a uh, well duality somewhere or do we use well duality classical well duality between general linear group and symmetry group well in some sense yes uh, i mean it's uh, um it's a uh, yeah it's uh, so, so it's sort of it, it is given by the fact that uh, uh that uh, endomorphisms of the case tensor power are precisely the group algebra of this case so it's, yeah okay uh, so in some sense, uh, so it's uh, more like it interpolates the, so, so you know, so, so it's, uh, uh, everything is nice when n uh, is large enough. So, yeah. and uh, when uh, lambda mu, so, so when you only restrict your consideration to, uh, to the highest weight so, such that, well, the length of lambda and mu are, small enough and then on this subcategory it acts exactly like the so it looks like precisely as a category of representations of of glm so it's mm -hmm. it, it, so, so, so when you just consider something smaller then when n looks large enough compared to the highest weights you consider then then the two are Precisely the same, but it uh, also works like the Schurweil duality also looks best when uh, n is bigger than equals to yeah, bigger, some condition bigger, parameter. Even it's bigger than the, yeah. the, the, the tender power. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so let's uh, continue then. Um, so now I want to, want to discuss the ultra product construction. So um, let's start with defining what uh, an ultra filter is. So an ultra filter F on the non empty set S is a set of subsets of S that uh, satisfy the following properties. So uh, if we have uh, U1 and U2 in F, then their intersection must also lie in F. Uh, if for any U in S, uh, either U or its complement is in F, and uh, exactly one must be in F. And uh, if U1 is a subset of U2 and U1 is in F, then U2 is also in F. And uh, so there's a, another way of thinking about ultra filters. That is, uh, ultra filters are basically the same as uh, F2 valued characters on the ring of uh, F2 valued functions on S. So F2 valued functions on S, uh, well, we can think about them as just subsets of S, uh, but with some uh, ring structure. And now, um, F, if we consider a character, F2 valid character, we can consider a set of subsets on which it takes the value one. And then this is going to be an ultra filter in the sense of this definition here. So we can check that the property of being a character uh, translates to precisely this uh, three properties of the ultra filter. And uh, so an easy example of an ultra filter is uh, the so-called principal ultra filter. So we fix some uh, element S in S, then the principal ultra filter FS consists of all subsets of S that contain this fixed element. And uh, on the level of uh, F2 valid characters, we just take evaluation at point S. And when uh, S is a uh, finite set, then uh, all characters are evaluations and uh, all ultra filters are principal. However, when S is not finite, uh, we can show that there is something else. And uh, so for us, it will be important when S is a set of natural numbers. So it can be shown that there exists a non principal ultra filter on N. And uh, however, the proof of this, it requires the use of Thorne's lemma, so it's not constructive. So we don't really know uh, how this uh, ultra filter looks like. So, so we cannot actually describe uh, the set of subsets of M. And uh, it can also be shown that such an ultra filter must contain all cofinite sets. And uh, this uh, allows us to work with this uh, the principal ultra filter in some sense, so it's, it, it, it will be useful to, to work with uh, the ultra filters to know that uh, cofinite sets are con contained in this ultra filter. Okay, and um, so let us fix a non principal ultra filter F on N. Then, uh, for any collection of non empty sets Xn where N runs over natural numbers. Uh, we can define the ultra product as the quotient of the product by an equivalence relation. And we require that uh, the two sequences of elements are equivalent uh, if uh, they are equal for all k, uh, for, uh, so, so for almost all k, and that is for all k in some u in f. Just another way of saying that uh, something is true for all k in some uh, u in the ultra filter, uh, we'll say that it's true for almost all k. And um, we can uh, modify this definition slightly to include also the case of uh, some of the extents being empty, but uh, it's just some technicality. And uh, now um, there is a nice theorem by Voss uh, that uh, roughly states that uh, any first order language statement that is true for almost all accents uh, is also true for the ultra product. And in practice, uh, we will only use uh, the following examples of the um, application of this theorem. So 
let uh, all accents be groups, algebras, or fields, or otherwise have some other algebraic structure in them. Uh, then the ultra product will also have this algebraic structure and it will be inherited from this algebraic structure on the product. Now, uh, if Xn's are vector spaces over the corresponding fields Fn, then the ultra product will be a vector space over the ultra product of the fields. There is also a known example, so some statements uh, that where you cannot apply Lavoisier's theorem. Uh, so if Vn's are finite dimensional vector spaces, uh, then the ultra product is not necessarily finite dimensional anymore. So we cannot express finiteness here in the terms of the first order language logic. Um, well, However, so um, if the dimensions of uh, Vn are universally bounded for all n or for almost all n, then it will be finite dimensional. And that is because uh, the, the property of being a basis, it is a, it is a first order uh, statement. And uh, so, so we can express it uh, in first order logic and uh, therefore, uh, therefore, if uh, if the ends have a basis of the same size for almost all n, then we'll, we are done. Then the alter product will also have the, this basis. Now, uh, another example that we'll use is that uh, we take uh, f n to be the algebraic uh, closure of Q. Then, as uh, the alter product by Wos's theorem is going to be an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, and uh, it can be shown uh, that it has cardinality continuum, and therefore, by Steinitz theorem, it will be non-canonically isomorphic to C. Okay, so that's it. And now. Uh, if you have a collection of small categories, Cn, where n runs over natural numbers, we can define uh, the alter product, the category C, the alter product of Cn's, uh, such that objects of C are just the alter product of objects of Cn. And if you have a pair of objects, X that the alter pro is a, the alter product of Xn's and Y is the alter product of Yn's, we define uh, the homes between them as uh, the ultra product of uh, the homes between Xn and Ym inside the corresponding categories. And uh, yeah, let me note that uh, if uh, Cn's were linear over uh, some fields Fn, then uh, the category C will inherit a linear structure over the ultra product of these fields. Now, uh, the theorem due to Deline, uh, so let a T be some transcendental complex number. Then uh, we can realize the category rep GLT as some subcategory inside the ultra product of uh, uh, the categories of representations of GLN over Q bar. And we do this uh, in a similar way as we defined our category in the first place. So the category of GLT will be isomorphic to the Karubi envelope of the symmetric rigid monoidal subcategory inside the ultra product of the categories of GLN over Q bar that is generated by as a single object V. And V now is defined as the ultra product of Vn, where Vn is a tautological n-dimensional representation of uh, GLN over Q bar. And uh, so now we want as this object V to, has, to have dimension T. So the C linear structure on rep GLT, uh, well, a priori, so, so rep GLT will have the linear structure over the ultra product of Q bars. And so we choose an isomorphism between this ultra product with C that sends the sequence of uh, numbers one to three and so on to our complex number t. And this is because each Vn has dimension n. 
So we, and we want V to have dimension T. And note that uh, we, the T that we can obtain here after such an isomorphism are only transcendental. So they can only be transcendental because there is no polynomial that has zeros on all positive integers. So uh, in the, for any transcendental T, there exists such an isomorphism because we can just uh, apply automorphisms of C over Q bar and send any transcendental number to any other transcendental number. Okay, and uh, now uh, another note is that uh, if you want to uh, obtain a, an algebraic value of T in this way, so we will we'll need to be able to solve equations. So we will need to solve uh, polynomial equations so that uh, our polynomial has zeros in every positive integer. So uh, therefore we'll need to work with uh, positive characteristics. And uh, so the construction for algebraic T is due to Nate Harmon and he constructed rep GLT as a subcategory inside the ultra product of uh, categories of representations of GLN. But uh, instead of Q bar here, you'll need to take the algebraic closure of uh, FPN, where PNs are some, uh, some primes uh, that uh, uh, tend to infinity and goes to infinity and that uh, allow you to solve some of your polynomial equations. So it can be shown that there such primes exist, and so you can uh, do similar construction. But, but sorry, uh -huh. can I can I just ask a question? In that case, it means we consider GLT over that field instead of C, right? Or oh no, so so let me yeah, yeah so it wasn't very clear. So we can consider fields F uh, P N bar. Yeah. And uh, when we take the outer product of them, so PNs uh, are oh, yeah, different, okay. they tend to infinity. And uh, it, uh, it will actually turn out that this field also has uh, characteristic zero and it's yeah. also algebraically closed and it will also have a cardinality continuum. So we we'll, can also choose an isomorphism with it, uh, of it with C. So it will still be C linear. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, so for simplicity, let me now assume that T is transcendental from now on, and we will only work uh, in characteristic zero. Okay, and uh, so this is the ultra product construction. Uh, any questions about it? Okay, good. Um, uh, so we'll now use this construction and we'll do some rep theory in rep GLT. Um, okay, so, um, so, so it's uh, been half an hour. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this and yeah, we'll have a break somewhere. Okay, so, um, so we can define the Lie algebra object uh, denoted GLT as an object is this uh, just uh, V tensor V dual. Uh, and having our ultra product construction, we say that it's uh, the ultra product of Lie algebras GLN. Uh, um, and uh, it's a Lie algebra object in Rep GLT, so it will have this uh, skew symmetric commutator map. And uh, GLNs uh, all act on the object of the corresponding categories and on in the object as well. And as a corollary of this, we get that there is a natural action of uh, the Lie algebra object GLT on every object of int of Jeb GLT. We can also define uh, the universal enveloping algebra U of GLT uh, as in the classical case. So we define it as a quotient of the tensor algebra T of GLT by the standard commutator relations. And uh, it has a poincare birgov feed filtration, FKU, uh, that uh, is inherited from the filtration on the tender algebra. And uh, so FKU is going to be isomorphic to the uh, ultra filter, ultra product of uh, FK of U of GLM. 
where here FK of U of GLN is the, the usual Poincare Biogo feed filtration on the universal enveloping algebra. And uh, so we need to consider some filtrations here because, so I want to make this remark, that it's important. So we need to look at the filtrations because the ultra product construction, it only gave us the realization of uh, objects in Rep GLT as ultra products of something classical. And uh, in the objects, uh, well, for them, we, we need filtration. So, and, we can, so, and uh, by construction, uh, U of GLT is an end object. So to, to work with ultra product, we, we really need this filtration. And uh, now, so if we have the center of U, Z, uh, then we can realize it as, a, as homes from the unit object to U. So, well, our U was an uh, algebra in the, in the category, so it wasn't real algebra, it was like an algebra object. However, the center of U uh, is going to be just the regular algebra in the category of vector spaces because of this realization. And uh, it inherits the filtration from U and uh, FK of Z is an ultra product of FK of Z of U of GLN. And we know what the center of U of GLN is. So uh, it's just the polynomial algebra with uh, generators uh, uh, Z1 through Zn in each degree 1 through n. And uh, the Pankarabiogo fit filtration is a filtration by the degree of polynomials. And uh, so therefore, we just can easily compute this. Uh, this ultra product, and we compute the Z, and uh, the result we get that Z is uh, the algebra of uh, polynomials in infinitely many generators, Z1, uh, Z2, and so on, such that the degree of ZK is equal to K. And uh, now, moreover, uh, so we can specify some particular choice of generators in Z. And um, we do this, uh, so so we say that zi is uh, the ultra product of uh, some zi n's, and uh, zi n is a central element in U of GLN. And for U of GLN, we have the Harris Chandra isomorphism. So we need to specify some a polynomial function on the set of weights that is invariant under the action of the wild group. And the wild group for GLN is a symmetric group. So we need some symmetric polynomial. And uh, here is going to be just my choice of some of symmetric polynomials. So it's just my choice of generators. And uh, all the results we'll have afterwards will depend on this choice. However, it's just a convenient one. So uh, I choose uh, the symmetric polynomial that is the power sum of the coordinates of the weight. So ZIM acts on the Verma module M chi with the highest weight chi minus rho via uh, the ice power sum of the coordinates of the, of co coordinates of the weight chi. And now um, if you have a central character uh, theta from Z to C, we can define the exponential generating function of theta. So theta of U is defined as the usual sum of one over i factorial theta of the i u to the i. And uh, well, the central character is determined by its values on this generator z i. Therefore, our theta is uh, uniquely determined by its exponential generating function. So for me, it's just going to be a compact way of storing information about the central character. Okay, so uh, there are some notations. Now uh, let's talk about uh, bimodules. And I want to do this in the general setting. So I want to do this simultaneously in for classical Hirschhandra bimodules and for our setting in the, the complex rank of the Berlin categories. So let uh, uh, C be the category uh, of, well, be either rep GLT or uh, the category of complex representations of some reductive group G. And uh, so we can uh, define uh, some um, Lie algebra object G in C 
that uh, acts naturally on all objects of in C. So in this case, it's going to be the Lie algebra GLT that we had uh, before. And the, in this case, it's going to be the Lie algebra G that corresponds to our reductive group G. So um, um, we can actually do this for any symmetric tender category C. So, uh, so, so it can, everything uh, that I'm going to talk about now can actually be defined in the, in the most general setting possible. So for any symmetric tensor category C, we can uh, define the, uh, the well, al algebraic uh, group scheme uh, in, the, in C that is uh, so-called pi, pi one of C and uh, for, to this algebraic group scheme, we can assign the Lie algebra object and it will act on all objects of C and all on int objects. And uh, we can do this uh, construction. Uh, but uh, yeah, but for our purposes, let's stick to these two cases. Okay, and uh, now, so let me fix some notations. So let G opposite be the opposite Lie algebra. Uh, u square be the tensor product of u of g and u of g opposite. Uh, z square uh, is the center of u square, and uh, so we can show that it's just the tensor product of two copies of z. Now uh, let uh, k inside g plus g opposite uh, be the anti-diagonal subalgebra, and uh, it's easy to see that it's um, as a Lie algebra, it's isomorphic to g. And uh, so any U square module Y uh, in, in C uh, can be considered as a U by module. So this is because uh, the left action of U of G opposite is the same as the right action of U of G. And uh, when we consider the restriction of uh, Y to this uh, subalgebra K, it's the same as considering the adjoint representation on uh, the bimodule Y. So it's just uh, uh, how you should think about this uh, subalgebra K. So it's the restriction to it is, is just the adjoint representation on the corresponding bimodule. Now, so we say uh, that uh, U bimodule Y in, in C is K algebraic. If the action of uh, K on Y coincides with the natural action of G. So K is isomorphic to G, so we can require this. And in some sense, uh, the way you should think about this is uh, that we think of objects of C rather than in the objects of C as finite dimensional representations of our Lie algebra G. And uh, uh, now, when we ask that, uh, so since the natural action is the locally finite action, so we sort of ask that wh why a joint as a representation of G is just the direct sum of finite dimensional things. Well, that's just the intuition behind this. And, uh, so the categorical definition is like this. And now, um, well, K algebraic by modules are basically the same as left U modules in, in C. So we only need to know what the left action is because we already know what the diagonal action is. So the diagonal action on in C is the natural action. And when we know the left action in, and diagonal action, we can recover the right action as well. And uh, so we say that the U by module Y in, in C uh, fi is finitely generated uh, if it is a quotient of the bimodule u tensor x tensor u for some x in C. And this bimodule is sort of the free bimodule generated by our object x. So, so just the left uh, action is on u by left multiplication, or the right action on the right copy of u by right multiplication. And the finite generatedness uh, comes from the fact that x is in C rather than in int C. And we say that y is generated by x well, in this case. And uh, so there's a nice example. So for any x in C, we let uh, phi x to be the bimodule uh, that is an object is isomorphic to x tensor u. Uh, 
And uh, so as a biomodule, it defined as follows. So uh, the actions, right action is uh, via right multiplication on U. And the left action is via co-multiplication. So it acts on both factors. On X, it's, uh, it acts via the natural action. And on U, it acts via the left multiplication. So uh, phi X adjoint is going to be isomorphic to X tensor U adjoint. And the adjoint action is the natural action on the universal enveloping algebra. So uh, U adjoint is uh, just isomorphic to symmetric uh, algebra of G. So it's uh, just a direct sum of uh, symmetric powers of G. So it's locally finite, dimensional in some sense. So phi X is uh, K algebraic. And it is also finitely generated as it is a quotient of uh, U tensor X tensor U. So a very nice by module. So um, let me, let me say a few things about this by module, and uh, then we'll take a break. So, uh, so the by modules of phi x um, enjoy nice properties. That uh, uh, so, if we consider homes from phi x to any by module y in in C, then it's going to be the same as homes uh, over G from x to y adjoint. So let me sketch the proof. So, uh, so if we restrict uh, to x tensor one, uh, then it uh, gives a map in one direction, so in this direction. Uh, and uh, conversely, so if uh, we have some map from x to y adjoint, uh, so we can consider well this action on the right from y tensor u to y, uh, and then well. Okay, so so the, 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 here's the formula. So, so so we can construct the desired map for just by, by using right action on y. So it first send x to y adjoint, and uh, then we act on the right on y. Okay, and uh, uh, so so it, as a corollary of this, we get that um, any finitely generated k algebraic by module y in, in C is a quotient of phi x for some uh, x in C. And uh, so the proof, uh, we take the x that generates y, and uh, then uh, the map from x to y is a map of k modules. So, so, so x is some generating sub-object. It's a map of k modules, and it induces a surjective map from phi x to y, because it's a map of my modules, and the image contains this generating sub-object. OK, so yeah, so we're going to use extensively this by modules phi x in the future. But uh, yeah, so, so let me yeah, uh, pose this question and uh, take a break. So, so yeah, so after the break, we're going to define Finally, define what a higher chunk of my modules in C. Um, yeah, so I think that I rushed a bit for the previous slide, so I just wanted to stress one more time. So, uh, important corollary for us is that so by modules phi x, they subject onto all uh, finitely generated k algebraic by modules y. So it's just something we should uh, keep in mind, and. Uh, so now, uh, how do we define a higher chunder by module? Can, can you also remind me of the definition of this by module? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So it's, um, OK, so so it's defined so, so it's as, as an object is just the tender product of x with u. So x is some uh, object in C, so some uh, finite dimensional object in no sense. And uh, so, so the action on the right is only on U, and the action on the left is just uh, via uh, co-multiplication on both factors. Uh, here it's natural, and on U it's left multiplication. And uh, OK, so this is our modules phi x. And uh, now uh, we want to define the higher standard by modules in the way that uh, our definition will be compatible with the classical definition. So it's, uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, there are actually two ways to do this. And um, 
So let y in, in C be a finitely generated k algebraic by module with both of these um, conditions. Then we can uh, first, uh, the first option, we can ask that uh, the multiplicity of each x in y adjoint is finite. And this is some sort of admissibility condition. And it's a, it's a classical way to define Harris Chandler by modules, actually. So it's more natural in some sense. However, uh, there is also another way. Uh, we can ask that uh, the center, z square, acts finitely on y. That is the annihilator uh, inside the z square of y is an ideal of finite co-dimension. And uh, the condition one uh, always implies condition two, so it's more restrictive. And um, so let me sketch the proof of this. So if uh, z square acts, uh, so 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 sorry, z square acts on the multiplicity space of x inside y adjoint because uh, z square commutes with the action of k. And uh, since uh, this uh, multiplicity space is finite dimensional by assumption, then the annihilator inside z square of it is uh, uh, an ideal of finite codimension. And then we take x to be the generating subobject of y. And uh, then it can be easily shown that the two annihilators must actually coincide. And uh, so will show that it shows that this annihilator is an ideal finite codimension. And uh, so why do we say that there are two options? Uh, it is because in the classical case, the condition two also implies condition one. So they are equivalent ways of defining higher gender by modules. And so if C is a category of representation of a reductive group G, then uh, uh, condition two implies condition one, that is uh, when the center acts finitely, uh, then uh, the multiplicities are finite. And so let me sketch the proof so we can uh, consider the annihilator of Y inside the right copy of the center. So only consider only the right action of the center, then the annihilator is going to be uh, an, it's, it's some ideal of finite codimension. Then, uh, Y is a quotient of phi L for some object L. And uh, hence, uh, it is also an object of L tensor U modular J. And this is because, well, uh, the right action of the center on, on in here factors through the quotient by the ideal. And uh, now homes from X to Y adjoint are, well, as we know, uh, they are the same as, uh, uh, well, so, so, uh, yeah, so, 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 so they lie inside homes from uh, X to this by module. And uh, so they are, we can just use the, the duality and say that it's, uh, and the center, well, the action, so, so, so the idea here is that uh, this I, I, ideal, it, uh, uh, commutes with uh, the uh, with the action of uh, G, so we can uh, quotient after uh, we take Holmes, and uh, then it's just uh, the fact that uh, the so so uh, what we have here is some Holmes from some finite dimensional thing into U adjoint uh, quotient by the ideal of uh, finite uh, co-dimension. And uh, uh, then we use the constant theorem that says that such homes uh, are, well, it is a free uh, Z module of rank uh, that is equal to the dimension of the zero weight space of this uh, finite dimensional thing. And so uh, G is an ideal of finite co-dimension and therefore a free module if, if, if we quotient the free module uh, of a finite rank uh, uh, by an ideal of finite codimension, then we'll get something finite dimensional. Okay, so that's the idea. And so uh, in the classical case, the two definitions are equivalent, uh, but uh, in general, let me pick the more, the less restrictive one to say that uh, uh, 
for further definition of higher standard by modules. So we say that a finitely generated K algebraic by module Y in, in C is a higher standard by module if it satisfies condition two, so that uh, the center acts finitely on Y. And we denote by HC the corresponding category. And we say, uh, so if Y satisfies condition one, then we say that this is a higher standard by module of finite K type. And we need two definitions because in the complex run case, these are not equivalent. So let me uh, give you an example. So let uh, theta be some central character of U. Then uh, let U theta be the quotient of U by the ideal generated uh, by the kernel of theta. Then it's uh, easy to see that U theta is a higher chunter by module because the center acts on the left wire, uh, this central character, and on the right wire, the same central character. So uh, uh, the quotient by this uh, ideal, by the annihilator, is just, just a C. So it's uh, clearly an ideal fine co dimension. And uh, however, uh, this by module won't have finite K type. And this is also due to this, uh, well, I mean, it can be shown rigorously, but intuitively speaking, it is due to this uh, Coston's theorem. So the Coston's theorem says that uh, homes from something uh, finite dimensional to uh, U theta joint. So we can, let me write this down. So homes from X to U, theta adjoint, uh, well, they have as a vector space, they are just uh, x zero. So they have the same dimensions as, uh, as a zero weight space of x. And uh, the idea here is that uh, when we consider this for GLN, so if x is a GLN module, then it's a zero weight space, uh, uh, the dimension of this, uh, weight space, it's a gross polynomial with n. And so with a limit case, we'll won't have something finite dimensional. But it's just, well, the intuition behind this. Okay, so yeah, so we have our two definitions. And uh, uh, because uh, the center acts finitely on uh, uh, higher gender by modules, we get the block decomposition for HC. So HC is a direct sum of uh, the categories that I denote HC tilde of theta one, theta two. And uh, by this, I mean the subcategory on which the center, D square, and we know that this is just the tensor product of Z with itself, acts via generalized central character theta one tender theta two. So here theta one and theta two are just central characters of U. And uh, now the question that we want to answer is uh, for which pairs of central characters, theta one and theta two, is the category HC field of theta one, theta two non-zero? And uh, we cl clearly, we can uh, only consider a smaller subcategory, which I denote by HC theta one, theta two without the field. And this is a subcategory of which uh, Z square acts via non-generalized central character, theta one, theta two. And it, it is enough to answer this question for these categories. And this is because any non-zero object in uh, HC tilt uh, will have a quotient, non-zero quotient in uh, HC theta one, theta two without the tilt. Okay, so that's the question. And uh, so what happens in the classical case? So let C be the category of representation of uh, group G. Then uh, HC theta one theta two is non-zero if and only if there exist Verma modules M chi one, M chi two, uh, such that uh, the center acts uh, via theta i on M chi i, and such that the difference of these corresponding weights lies uh, in the lattice of integer integer la weight lattice for G. That is, uh, it is a weight of some uh, finite dimensional G module. Let me sketch the proof. So, um, well, any 
module in HC theta one theta two will be a quotient of uh, phi x of theta two. And by this, I just mean, uh, well, something that we had before. So it's just going to be the quotient of phi x by the uh, ideal generated by the kernel of theta two on the right. So it's, as an object, it's going to be just x tensor u theta two. So now if uh, z acts via central character theta two on the uh, Berman module m chi, then uh, we have an embedding of uh, u theta two into endomorphisms of this uh, module m chi. As a corollary, we get an embedding of uh, by modules of uh, phi x of theta two into linear homes between m chi and x tensor m chi. And now if you want to study the action uh, of the left copy of the center on this one module, it is enough to look at the left, uh, at the action of the center on uh, the module X tensor M chi. And X tensor M chi is, has uh, standard filtration by uh, verbal modules, M chi plus lambda, where lambda runs over the multi-set of weights of X. And uh, so, and this, uh, finishes the proof because uh, now, uh, uh, so the center acts via some central character on M chi plus lambda, uh, and this is going to be the central character theta one. And uh, so the, the uh, difference of the corresponding weights to theta one and theta two, so this difference will be precisely lambda and it lies in this lattice. Okay, and uh, now, uh, what happens in the complex ring case? So let's see the reptile T. Then uh, the category HC theta one theta two is non-zero if and only if. Okay, now the condition is a bit weird. So we take the difference of the corresponding uh, exponential generating functions for theta one and theta two, and uh, so the statement is that this difference is given by the following problem formula for any r for any s and for any coefficients b i and c j and uh, so before i uh, break down this formula a little bit so let me give you the taste of what the answer looks like for uh, the categories rep ot and rep sp 2 t then uh, in these cases uh, this hc theta 1 theta 2 is non zero if and only if the difference of the exponential generating functions is given by uh, such a formula. And let me uh, say what the differences here are. So the first difference is uh, that, well, so we have a difference of two hyperbolic cosines instead of uh, exponents. Why is that? This is due to the fact that, uh, so, well, first of all, the formula really depends on our choice of generators because our definition of exponential generating function depended on the choice of generators. And recall how we chose the generators. We had to pick some uh, polynomial function on the set of weights that is a uh, invariant at this action of the while group. And for GLN, this was a symmetric uh, group. And so we got our uh, power sum polynomials. And uh, here, uh, the while group, uh, roughly speaking, it will be the semi-direct product of this symmetric group with z mod to z uh, to the n. And uh, therefore, invariant polynomials will be symmetric polynomials in the squares of uh, variables. And so we can choose the generator to be the power sum in the squares. So, so only even power sums of our uh, coordinates of the weights. So, and uh, this will uh, give us the difference between the exponent and the hyperbolic cosine, because now we only sum uh, even powers. And uh, the other difference here is that there's a negative summand here. Uh, and uh, here we only sum the po positive things. And uh, this is due to the fact that uh, in the uh, rep uh, GLT, there exists an object V dual. And uh, for OT and SP2T, V dual is going to be isomorphic to V. So we won't have this. 
Okay, and uh, so this is the rough intuition behind this, and now I want to sketch the proof of this um, theorem. And um, now, uh, so any bimodule y in HC theta one theta two is a quotient of uh, phi x of theta two, and any reasonable x uh, going to be a quotient of uh, this generating object R S. Now, uh, once you understand uh, for each theta one the quotient which I denote phi x theta one theta two, it's just uh, going to be the quotient of the thing we had before by the ideal generated by the kernel theta one on the left. So we we, we already quotient out by the kernel theta two on the right. Now we quotient by the kernel of theta one on the left as well. And so we want to understand when it is non-zero and it is enough to take X to be this RS. And then we do this by induction on the R plus S and we do this in the classical setting. And then we take the ultra product or the results that we get. And uh, so I want to give you an example of the computation in the easiest case, uh, case, but for this, let me fix the notation. So, uh, so let eta be the map that sends a weight to the corresponding central character, just like this. Now, um, so the computation will be for the case when R S is equal to one zero, so just the base of induction in some sense. So. In this case, when well, r is equal to one, s is equal to zero, so we consider by modules of phi vn of theta two. So we do this in the classical setting. So phi vn of theta two, as before, we can embed into homes now over q bar uh, from uh, m chi to vn tensor m chi such that uh, the corresponding central character to chi is uh, our theta two. And uh, now, as before, we want to study uh, the left action of the center on this bimodule, and uh, it is enough to study the action of the center on this module, v n tensor m chi. And so this thing is uh, filtered by m chi plus uh, e i, where e i are weights of v n, so uh, theta one for which this quotient is not zero are precisely eta of chi plus ei, or e1 through en are weights of this n-dimensional uh, tautological representation of GLM. Now, uh, so okay, so, so now we want to compute uh, the corresponding uh, exponential generating functions. And uh, here it is important which generators we choose. So uh, let's compute eta of uh, chi plus ei on the case generator. And the case generator, as you recall, is given just by the case power sums. And uh, now uh, the fact that we added this weight EI, it uh, will result in the fact that uh, we added one to the i's coordinate of chi. So we take the case power sum of chi where we shift the i's coordinate of chi by one. That is what is written here. And uh, now, when we consider the difference of the two uh, exponential generating functions for our initial weight, so uh, our initial central character, so initial central character what was eta of chi equal to theta two, and we have our new central character that is eta of chi plus ei, and so here, well, for for eta of chi, we we won't uh, have the shift of the coordinate; we'll just have the power sum of the coordinates of chi. So we actually, we compute the exponential generating function for this thing here. And the, uh, yeah, it's easy to see that it's going to be just a difference of two exponents. So it's going to be a, a exponent of uh, chi i plus one minus the exponent of uh, chi i. And then we take the ultra product and uh, we get that uh, it is non-zero only if uh, the difference is given by the difference of two exponents for some complex number b. And uh, yeah, as a reminder, so we were trying to prove that in general, uh, the difference is given by uh, such a formula. And the note that uh, we only got like one sum in here. And this is because r is equal to one and s is equal to zero. 
that is it. And now uh, the question is, uh, so for which, so, so, so which values, complex values B we can obtain as a difference? So recall that, well, in the classical case, this uh, coefficients were precisely the uh, coordinates of the corresponding weights. So there were only finitely many of them possible. And so, and what happens in the complex rank case? Which values of B can appear here? And the answer is that actually any complex number B works. So for any complex B, this is non zero when uh, theta one is, uh, my, theta one of U minus theta two of U is given by this difference of two exponents. And uh, well, I sketch the proof, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, maybe it's not very reasonable to, to, to give this short sketch, but the idea here, so, so when you work with the ultra products is, so, so we, we have this complex number B we, uh, that is the ultra product of some B ends where B n is in Q bar and uh, our uh, central character theta two that is the ultra product of central characters. Uh, C the two of n, and our basic idea is that we construct new central characters, C to n, such that uh, they correspond to some uh, weight. So each C to n corresponds to some weight chi, such that the first coordinate of chi is precisely our number b. So recall, so, so so if if we can do that, then it works because now it is a coordinate of, of the corresponding weight. And uh, in the classical case, it, uh, the classical case gives us that such B uh, works for us. And uh, now uh, we also want uh, to require that for a fixed K, the sequence of uh, theta n uh, of Z, ZK, so we fix a K and uh, we uh, allow n to go to infinity. And we ask that it coincides with theta two of zk uh, for all large enough n. So we only uh, change the values of theta two of n in the finite number of positions, and we can do this because our alter filter contains all cofinite sets, and uh, then we obtain a new uh, central character that actually going to be, well, is then when we take the ultra product, we'll actually end up with the same thing. And uh, however, uh, we constructed now the set of weights for each GLN such that uh, the first coordinate is given by our complex, uh, by our number that we want. And then at, at the end, we'll get the, the desired result. Uh, okay, so this is the idea. And the, well, such phenomena happen. So in the in, in in the classical case, you only get the finite number of things, and now you have suddenly have infinitely many, uncountably many things that work, and the, everything become, becomes uh, very um, large and wild and uh, more difficult to study, and in particular. Uh, in the complex rank case, uh, now uh, objects won't have finite lengths, for example. And uh, so everything is more difficult in some sense. And this is mostly due to the fact that we had two definitions and we picked a more general one. And maybe the definition that was more same, uh, that had like this uh, finite K type condition, it was more suitable, uh, so it, it, it more closely represented uh, the classical case. But uh, uh, so I, I want to now talk about this finite K type by modules. There are some difficulties in studying them as well, uh, but in some sense, they uh, are nicer than just this general Harris Chandra by modules. Uh, so yeah, so, so that's all about this, uh, central character classification. So uh, any questions? Okay. Um, yeah, so 
yeah, so let's now try to study this uh, finite k type by modules. So maybe in some sense they are nicer. And uh, so, uh, for example, we have the following lemma. So let uh, y1, y2 in hc, theta1, theta2 be some uh, harsh standard by modules. And suppose y2 has finite k type. Then uh, the dimension of homes between y1 and y2 is finite. So let me prove this. So y1 is a quotient of uh, phi x theta 1 theta 2 for some x. And so the dimension is uh, of these homes is less or equal than the dimension of homes from phi x theta 1 theta 2 to y2. And uh, we can forget about theta 1 theta 2 because y2 is already in this category. So it's the same as uh, homes from phi x to y2. And the recall we had this uh, nice property of phi x that uh, said that this uh, dimension is precisely the dimension of uh, homes between x, uh, uh, from uh, homes from x to y2 are joined. And this is finite by the definition of the finite k type of y2. So, yeah. And the, uh, in particular, uh, sorry. So in particular, as a corollary of this lemma, uh, we get that all uh, objects uh, of finite k type have finite lengths. So it's nicer. And uh, so now the question is, do can we even construct examples of uh, bimodules of finite k type? So do they exist? For <laughs> and uh, the easy answer is yes, so of course. So there are quite easy bimodules of finite k type. So these are some sort of finite dimensional bimodules. So you can take uh, two bipartitions, lambda, lambda prime, mu prime, take the tensor product of the corresponding uh, um, simple, uh, well, in decomposable, well, for in our case, it's going to, they're going to be simple uh, objects in RepGLT. And then uh, this is a higher standard by module of finite k type. So, yeah, so we act on the left on, on this uh, module, on the right on this module. So, yeah, definitely a finite k type. Uh, so, now can we construct some other examples? Uh, well, let's try to do this. So, uh, now, uh, so the idea is. Well, let's consider just uh, uh, classical higher standard by modules and uh, take their outer product. But uh, uh, we cannot do this because uh, in general, higher standard by modules are not finite dimensional. So uh, we, we would like some filtration. So we take filtered outer product, um, a sort of restriction, uh, restricted outer product with respect to given filtration. Okay, so let's try to do this. So uh, let uh, yn be a higher standard by module for GLN. Uh, Fk of yn is some filtration by finite dimensional k modules, uh, such that it agrees with the PBW filtration on u square. Then uh, we take uh, uh, define Fk of y as the ultra product of Fk yn, and we take the union of the, this filtered components, and we'll get something that has the action of u square on it. So u square acts on this object. However, so this object is uh, a priori is just the object of the inside the ultra product. So it's an end object of the ultra product of the categories of rep GLN uh, over C. So it's the representations of GLN over C. And it, a priori, it's not in RepGLT. So RepGLT is only some small subcategory inside the ultra product. So we need uh, some requirements so, so that we can legally take this ultra product and end up in RepGLT. And the requirement is the following. So we need to ask that uh, for any bipartition, new new prime, the multiplicity of uh, the well, the uh, simple module V with the highest weight uh, new new prime N, so the one that we defined uh, long before we talked about our product, but uh, we look at such a simple thing. Uh, and uh, we require that the multiplicities of this thing inside FK of YN 
is constant for almost all n. When we do this, then we can legally take the ultra product and end up in RepGLT. Okay, so this is some constraint. Now uh, we want to end up uh, with something of finite k type. So now, uh, if we want to do this, we ask that uh, the multiplicity of uh, such a v corresponding to the bipartition new and new prime is finite uh, or is constant for almost all m inside. So, so, so the multiplicity now we take inside the whole y m, not in the filtered component f k y m. If this is true, if this is constant for almost all n, then no matter which filtration we take, uh, we'll end up uh, with the same uh, bimodule. And this is going to be a bimodule in, in the FGLT, and it will have a finite k type. And it will not depend on the filtration. So, okay, so the data we need now is a sequence of uh, bimodules for GLN, of Harishandra bimodules for GLN, such that the multiplicity in uh, YN adjoint of each uh, simple thing corresponding to our given by partition is constant. Okay. Uh, well, it turned out, uh, well, for me, it was uh, not uh, a very, is a task to classify such things so in general, like how do you even co compute this uh, multiplicities for general Harishandra by module? So it's, uh, well, I mean, you can do this, but it's not uh, an easy computation. And, uh, uh, but uh, something that I was able to do is to consider this uh, multiplicities for finite dimensional by module. So, so you can take uh, just uh, linear homes from one finite dimensional thing to another, it's a finite dimensional by module. And then you try to compute the multiplicities of, uh, of a given thing inside this and uh, uh, say, and try to come up with uh, some condition for which uh, on, on this highest weights, lambda n and mu n, so that uh, the multiplicity is uh, constant and uh, well there is a so there are some assumptions on the, the sequences of uh, highest weights lambda n and mu m and uh, uh, the assumptions that i came up with uh, roughly say that if you consider the corresponding partitions and the young diagrams for the corresponding partitions then uh, the requirement is that the length of the diagonal of this young diagram is constant for almost all m. So yeah, kind of a weird uh, condition, but I couldn't uh, find any better one. So, so all the examples uh, that I know of, they all um, lie in this uh, set of examples. So yeah, so now we take this uh, highest weights lambda n and mu n with our restrictions, uh, our assumptions, and then uh, we can compute the multiplicity of uh, each uh, v new new prime n inside the homes. And the, under these assumptions, it's going to be constant for almost all n. And as a corollary, we can define uh, some, uh, some by modules that are the ultra product of this uh, fine dimensional things. And uh, uh, I denote this by modules uh, home mu lambda, and mu and lambda are going to be some combinatorial data uh, data for uh, composed out of this uh, mu n and lambda n. So it's going to be a set of uh, some complex numbers and some partitions, something like this. And I can give more details later if you like to. And uh, so. Um, we take the filtered ultra product of these things, and uh, yeah, and uh, then we construct a bimodule of finite k type. And uh, these bimodules are simple, well, in the in, in in our construction, and they also so if we tender it with uh, v on the left or with v dual on the left, then we'll end up with just the direct sum of the, the same uh, bimodules where. We only change this parameters lambda and uh, some in, according to some rule. And uh, so, um, okay, so, so this um, allows us. So, so, so now I want to talk about the categorical actions 
so I don't know. So, so this condition here, it allows us to study some categorical actions on the subcategory generated by this, by modules. But uh, before I start uh, this discussion, I just want to mention that, well, this is uh, the, the best uh, I was able to do. And uh, so I don't know whether it's in any sense a full classification right now, but uh, I, I, it's definitely not the full full classification. So it's uh, so, so the parameters mu and lambda that we'll get here, they are going to be some sort of generic parameters. And uh, in this event, these generic uh, parameters become less generic, then the bimodules that we get, they won't be simple anymore, but then you can consider the equations in some sense. And uh, so, so, so maybe this the best we can hope for is that this set of bimodules gives us the full classification of some uh, generic, generic Parashana bimodules of finite K type. But it's still uh, not a very rigorous thing to say, but just our best hope. Now, uh, so, so let me say a few words about the uh, categorical uh, actions. So, uh, so categorical type action in, in particular. So let A be any additive category. Then uh, the categorical type A action on A is uh, defined as follows. So we need to a, a pair of uh, uh, under functors E and F that are uh, adjoined, and uh, I want them to be adjoined on both sides. I think, and. Uh, and we also have this data of natural transformations, tau, a natural transformation of F square, and X, a natural transformation of F. And uh, we want this uh, pair to define uh, the action, and action of the generate affine Henke algebra on uh, FD for any D, is, well, uh, where you think of uh, X uh, as this. Uh, uh, X as a, sorry as a, some variables X i uh, in the generator fine KK algebra tau as uh, the uh, permutations and so on. I, I mean there is a precise definition for this. Uh, I, I I don't have time to give all the details, but uh, the important thing is we think about this X as a sort of uh, Casimir element, and uh, we get the decomposition of the functor F. Uh, according to this, uh, well, to in, into direct sum of FC, where FC is a generalized eigenspace of X corresponding to the eigenvalue C. And similarly, one can define the decomposition of E into direct sum of EC, where EC is, a, is going to be a joint to FC on both sides. And you get such functors. And if uh, this uh, data works, then uh, important thing for us is that these functors EC and FC induce an action of the uh, uh, Lie algebra that I uh, denote SRC. But uh, well, it's just, uh, I, I, I just basically I just take the direct sum of uh, Lie algebras SLZ uh, for all R that runs over the um, uh, the, the, the quotient of C modulo Z. And uh, so, so we get this uh, the action of this algebra on the complexified growth in the group of A. And uh, so, so this algebra, it has generators EC and FC. So for SLZ, this, so, so, so I, I want this uh, continuous parameters only because the uh, eigenvalues can be any complex numbers, not necessary integers. If if they were integers, then we'll just get uh, the action of SLZ. And uh, so, so so we have this, uh, so so inside the SLZ the, the is generated by this uh, elements EC and FC, uh, they are just matrix element, uh, uh, elements uh, EC, C plus one and EC plus one C. And uh, the commutator relations are just the, the usual commutator relations for matrix elements. And what I'm saying here is that uh, 
you can consider the C not only be an integer, it can be any complex number. And th this will still make sense. So you can still con consider the uh, commutator relations uh, in the usual way. Uh, that's just, uh, uh, I mean, it is a bit weird, but uh, just think about this as a collection of uh, uh, actions of SLZ. And then, um, so, 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 yeah, so, so there are some conditions, uh, but the uh, important thing for us is that uh, you have some uh, functors that are joined on both sides to each other, and they induce the action on the Grotenian group of the Lie algebra SLZ, well, SLC. Okay, and now uh, if we have uh, any rigid symmetric tensor category C and object V inside C, uh, and we can then consider the category of uh, objects in C with the action of GL of V. And I denoted a rep C of GLV. So uh, and then it enjoys a categorical type A action given by the functors uh, that is tensor multiplication by V and tensor multiplication by V dual. And uh, now our Casimir element X is uh, uh, just the, it, it's going to be, well, for each M it uh, lies inside endomorphisms of V tensor M. And endomorphisms of V tensor M are the same as uh, homes from V tensor V dual tensor M to L. And there is a, uh, natural home that is the action of uh, GLV on M. And we take this action as our Casimir element. And then our element tau is just the flip of two copies of V. So it doesn't affect um, uh, the, the module M, it only just uh, flips two copies of V. And this gives us the categorical type A action. Uh, whenever we have an object uh, with uh, action of GLV. And uh, as a corollary, so let's consider an example. So suppose our category is a category of representations of GLM. Uh, then uh, all eigenvalues of this X are going to be integer. And uh, therefore, so, so recall, like we've had this decomposition here. And uh, in all the examples that we are going to see, well, that we are interested in, uh, we'll only have a finite number of cosets over Z uh, for which the eigenvalues are non-zero. So, 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 so when the, all eigenvalues are integer, then there's only one copy of SLZ that uh, acts non-trivially. So we have the action of SLZ on uh, the complexified Grotening group. And as a module of SL over SLZ, it's going to be just the ends uh, exterior power of this natural uh, uh, infinite dimensional representation, that's C to the Z. And uh, uh, so, so we have that, so we have this, this any, if you have any finite dimensional GLN module, V lambda, then we can tender it with V. And uh, uh, so the rule is uh, that uh, we add uh, a square to the Young diagram. Right, and we take the direct sums of what is uh, happening. However, uh, it uh, uh, so, so we work with uh, GLM, so uh, lambda can have uh, in uh, negative parts, but we can still sort of think about the Young diagram for uh, this negative part here. So, uh, so, so we have we can uh, so so sorry, uh, the Young diagram for the positive part of lambda is going to be just the. The Young diagram for the corresponding partition, right? And then we have a negative part of lambda, and we can just uh, draw this on the left, right? As if they were uh, negatives. And uh, so, so, so the coordinates for the corresponding cells of the Young diagrams will be negative numbers, but it's okay, we can still do this. And then uh, when we tensor with V, we add, uh, we add a, a block to this diagram, uh, However, so so you think about this diagram as sitting, as looking like this. So 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 so, so we add a block. Uh, so so we can add a block here or here or here, or we can add a block here. And this corresponds to you know deleting, deleting a block from this negative uh, uh, young diagram here. 
and uh, well and uh, but we can still you know compute the content of this block that of the cell that we added it's uh, so we can still define the coordinates of this uh, of each cell and the content of it is going to be uh, the coordinate uh, so, so if a cell that we added had a coordinate i here and coordinate j here then the content of this cell will be uh, just i minus j and uh, so it turns out that uh, the content gives us precisely the eigenvalues of x so uh, then fc of uh, v lambda is going to be a direct sum of uh, v mu such that mu uh, is obtained from lambda by adding a cell of content c and uh, actually there can be no more than one such uh, non-zero mu so it's uh, and uh, and this gives us uh, the action of fc on v lambda and uh, we can actually check that it's uh, compatible with the action of uh, on uh, the nth exterior power. So because here we can just write uh, the basis for this as uh, uh, V I one, blah, 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 V I M such that I one is greater or equal than I two is greater or equal than I N. And when we have such a data then, oh, sorry, not greater or equal, so greater here. And then, uh, if you have such a data, we can uh, construct from this a uh, 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 highest uh, weight uh, integer uh, integer dominant weight for GLN. We just take uh, I one. Oh, sorry, you just take I, I one plus uh, I two plus I am something like this. I, I mean, we can. So, 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 so sorry. So so here we just. Uh, uh, we only have uh, like the strict inequalities, but we can uh, turn this into uh, non-strict inequalities. And then uh, we see that uh, to this, we can assign uh, some partition lambda. And uh, to this basis vector, we assign the module V lambda. And then even we uh, add, act by F uh, C plus, oh, sorry, sorry, E C plus one, C, then it acts on this by something via something non-zero only if one of the i n uh, i j's is equal to C, and then it uh, uh, adds one to this i j, and this precisely corresponds to adding uh, to the diagram of lambda a block of uh, a block of, of this content C. So, so that's. Um, uh, that's the computation for uh, GL REAP GLM. And uh, now uh, we can do this also in the complex rank case. And uh, sorry, so did I run out of time? So I probably, yeah, so I, 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 I just want to quickly say that, so, so for REAP GLT, uh, the answer will be uh, very similar, but instead of, uh, uh, finite veg wedges, we can uh, consider semi-infinite wedges. So it's uh, something that is known as a Fock module. And uh, sorry, well, 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 but for uh, REAP GLT, so, so when we add a block, so as so recall that we had this young diagram where we had a positive part and a negative part. And uh, now uh, the content of uh, the blocks that we uh, sort of take out of the negative part will depend on t. So, so uh, and therefore, so in the complex rank case, uh, we'll get that uh, we have two actions of SLZ. So, so one, uh, one will have um, uh, one will have the eigenvalues of the Casimir on, on, that are only integers. And uh, the other will have uh, mere, uh, eigenvalues that are integers shifted by t. And, uh, and then uh, we'll get that uh, the Grotendieck uh, uh, group of A uh, with respect to the action of these two Lie algebras is uh, going to be the uh, tensor product of the Fock module and the Fock module that is uh, sh shifted by uh, some automorphism of SLZ. 
And uh, yeah, so this is, the moral here is that uh, if we have a bimodule of uh, finite K type, then uh, we can tender it with uh, phi V, uh, phi V over U, and it's the same as, well, tensoring it with V, and we can uh, do this both on the left and on the right, and uh, the same for V dual. And so uh, by modules of finite K type enjoy this uh, two categorical type actions that commute. And uh, uh, so, and we know that if we don't take the finite K type, then, uh, well, this uh, by module is no longer, uh, can be no longer higher Chandra by module as we had for the case of V tensor U theta, right? So this, uh, this won't be a by module, uh, higher Chandra by module, but we can project onto, onto the corresponding, uh, uh, onto the subcategory on which is the center X, Y, some central character, but still, uh, as, I mean, this uh, action is uh, nicer when we only restrict to the finite K type. And uh, for example, we, uh, as we saw, the category that is generated by the homes, by this uh, in interior homes that we constructed before, it's fixed under this action. And we can uh, describe the complexified uh, Grotinje group as a module over SLC plus SLC. And uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, and uh, the computation will be similar to the examples that we had before, because this mod by modules interpolate uh, just the tensor product of two finite dimensional things. And uh, when we, uh, tensor it with V on the left, and then we just tensor this thing with V and then we decompose it correspondingly. And uh, we can study this uh, SLC action on uh, this thing. And uh, so, so the answer will depend on these parameters mu and lambda and uh, yeah, uh, in some sense. So, so there is some combinatorics that you can do. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I uh, ran out of time. So there was like this picture when I described how you uh, construct this uh, data of lambda uh, and mu using the diagram, but yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to hold you any longer. If you have any questions, uh, yeah, thank you. So let's thank Alexandra. Any questions or comments? I have a question. So about classification of simple Harish Chandra by modules. In the classical case, uh, one would uh, use uh, Bernstein Gilfand equivalence with category O. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible to do something like that here? Yeah, so that's uh, the main, one of the main problems uh, is that there is no category O. Uh, there is no uh, Torres, uh, the, we cannot, uh, we don't get this way decomposition and a lot of things uh, are, are less nice. Uh, but uh, there's one thing uh, we can do. Uh, we can consider the parabolic category or, uh, and uh, in general, so, so, I mean, it's more difficult than the usual category or in general, it doesn't give you the full picture, but, um, but here, so, so we can, define this parabolic category or in the sense that uh, we can uh, we get the functor from rep GLT to the tensor product of rep uh, GL T1 tensor with rep GL TK such that T is equal to T1 plus TK. And this is due to this um, universal property of rep GLT that we had. And uh, uh, under this, uh, so, so we can consider the image of uh, Lie algebra GLT inside this category. And we can construct this parabolic category. Oh, so the GLT, it will be uh, now decomposed into like this uh, thing, uh, the blocks, the block thing. And uh, on the diagonal, they're going to seat this. Uh, uh, Lie algebras uh, GL uh, TI, and uh, uh, we'll think about this uh, uh, 
uh, uh, subalgebra is a Levy subalgebra for GLT, and then, then we consider this uh, uh, unipotent part and, and uh, well, the unipotent part, like the subalgebra U, and then we can view all this parabolic stuff that we want, uh, and we, for example, can uh, uh, define the parabolic category O. And uh, we can then consider the action of uh, Harshandra by module on this category, uh, and maybe from studying uh, this uh, simultaneously for all decompositions. So for example, like uh, this numbers T1 and TK can be any numbers. It's, they are not restricted to integers, right? Uh, in this case, just uh, any decomposition into any sum works for us. Maybe considering uh, this action simultaneously for all such decompositions of T, will give you full information. But right now, like I, I was thinking about this, but I, I didn't well, yet get the results from this. So it's not that easy, unfortunately, but we can, uh, I, well, one can try to do this. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions or comments? Okay, so if it's not the case, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry for taking longer.